Well, you asked for it, so you're going to get it. Give me the Bible. That's what we just sang, so you're about to get some Bible. So open your Bibles, if you will, and get them prepared as we go through this lesson and we answer an objection. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome all of you here for our visitors. You're our honored guest. Uh, we are so happy to have you with us. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. We'd be so happy to attempt to, to do that for you. If you have any questions, if you have any comments about anything you've heard or seen this morning, please let us know. If you have any comments about the lesson that you're about to hear, let me know. Uh, I'll be back there when the lesson's over with, and I'd be more than happy to discuss it with you or answer any questions you may have. I'll ask that you do something for me. I'll ask that you open your Bibles. I'll ask that you look, go through this lesson with me point by point and prove everything that I say. This is a way in which we can make sure that we are preaching truth, and it's also uh, making you aware of your obligation. As was mentioned by Brother Rich in the prayer, in Acts chapter 17, Paul left from Thessalonica, and he went into Berea. And as, as he went into Berea, there were Jews there, and Paul was alleging and, and proving from the Old Testament that Jesus was Christ. And when these Jews heard what Paul preached, they checked it against the Old Testament. And when they found it to be true, it says in verse 12, that many were added unto the Lord. So it is encouraging and it's beneficial for us that if we prove the lesson and make sure that it is so, and, and that's your obligation, and my obligation is to speak as the oracles of God. We're going to do that this morning. As we introduce this lesson, we don't always do this kind of lesson. Typically, what we do on Sunday mornings is some kind of topical study. And then we do a depository lesson on Sunday nights, um, and we're in the book of Hebrews. So if you can make it back tonight, you won't be disappointed, I promise, uh, with the, the, uh, the book of Hebrews being studied. That is a phenomenal book, and we've, we've gained a lot from it. But as we introduce this lesson here this morning, uh, I'm kind of a book rat. So I'll go, and, and I go to a used bookstore occasionally, and I'll stop, and, and I'll read some of the things they have there. And there is a certain commentary, and it was from the, the quote-unquote Pensacola Bible Institute, but this is a Baptist uh, institution, uh, so they don't really use the Bible as they think they do. And these individuals are actually being antagonistic towards truth. And in their commentary on Acts 2 and verse 38, this Baptist so-called scholar would say that Peter had no understanding of the blood atonement. Therefore, it could not be possible that he believed baptism to affect remission of sins. Well, I believe that this is something that needs to be answered because it can be answered. And we're going to answer it here this morning in several points. But often I come across these kind of things, and I want to make sure that the, the, the truth is presented reasonably and logically because there's no reason for us to hide the truth, as Jeremiah 23 and verse 29 would say. Uh, he would say, it's not my word like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces. The truth is the hammer, and it has nothing to hide. So we're going to look at that this morning. They attempt uh, to argue this point to try to get rid of uh, baptism actually having anything to do with remission of sins in Acts 2 and verse 38. And I use that word try. Uh, you understand I emphasize that point. He actually went and he, he, he was presenting it from this point and it was basically if Peter knew nothing of the blood atonement of Christ, how it was actually going to atone for sins, then he could not actually believe that baptism and repentance affected remission. So as we go through this, we're going to show that this is not true. What I want you to do, though, is I want you to be reasonable. I want you to be rational. The law of rationality says we should only draw conclusions that are based upon adequate evidence. <coughs> so as we go through this, let's see if it's not reasonably, uh, if it's not reasonable of us to conclude or rational of us to conclude that Peter did know about how blood affected remission of sins and the concept of atonement, or if in fact he didn't. So I'll leave it up to you, and if anybody comes to the conclusion that it's not reasonable, I want you to let me know about it when you go out this door. And I want you to take about three minutes and let you and I discuss it. Okay? First, I'd like to demonstrate what atonement means. I've listed Strong's here for you, his concordance. Atonement, exchange, figuratively, an adjustment, that is restoration to divine favor, reconciliation. You know, it's interesting if the word atone, and I didn't even realize this, but atone is made up of two words, at one. And that's what it means. To atone is to be, to be one. So the only way we can be one with God is for something to atone for our sins so that we can be reconciled back into Him. So the concept of atonement is the concept of reconciliation. To be brought back into the favor again of God. That's all it means. It's, it's a big word and it's not used very often in the Bible, but that's really all that it means. Now... Remember the point of this lesson. 
We're going to demonstrate to you that Peter, the inspired apostle, knew full well the concept of blood atonement, which is contrary to what this fellow claimed. Let's begin here. Did Peter have any Old Testament knowledge? Peter was a Jew, wasn't he? If you look in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, it says this. Paul is speaking and he says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth, this is speaking of Peter and his cohorts, of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, who is a Jew? Peter. If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou to the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So, so Paul is speaking to Peter, and Peter's actually, uh, Peter's actually being basically a racist. Peter's actually saying, you know what, Jews, we really ought not to have much to do with these Gentiles. And Peter actually calls quite an uproar, so, so Paul rebukes him for it. And he says, Peter, you're a Jew. Why are you living like the Gentiles and telling the, the, the Jews they can't have anything to do with the Gentiles? That's pretty hypocritical. Peter was a Jew, wasn't he? In Acts chapter 10, verse 14, as Peter saw this vision come down from, uh, from heaven... And it was speaking of the inclusion of Gentiles into the church. And he saw this. And Peter was still, for some reason, he was still keeping aspects or customs of the law. He was still holding to the dietary principles. Now, he wasn't amenable to them anymore, but he was keeping them. And it says in chapter 10, verse 14 of the book of Acts, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, the point I'm making there is, can anybody show me in the Old Testament where a, a Gentile was amenable to God's dietary principles? No, you can't. I'll be back there when it's over with if you think you can. You can't. I can show you where Jews were amenable to it, though. Jews were amenable to the law of Moses, not Gentiles. Peter was amenable to this law while it was in effect. Peter was still holding to the customs, some of them, as it pertains to the dietary laws. Peter was a Jew, is the point I'm telling you. This nation, Israel, knew full well about the concept of blood atonement. Why, Eric, are you trying to prove to me that Peter was a Jew? We all know he's a Jew. Well, then you should know that he had some Old Testament knowledge, then, shouldn't you? Peter was a Jew. The Old Testament, all the way from Exodus, basically beginning in chapter 12, or really if you want to get down to it, chapter 5, all the way through the back of the book of Malachi, was principally written to whom? The nation of Israel. Not in every case, but overwhelmingly that was the majority of the Old Testament. Jews had a working knowledge of the Old Testament, and that included Peter. This nation, Israel, knew full well about the concept of atonement and the necessity of blood in order for it to be possible. In the Old Testament, the King James, the word atonement is used in 69 verses. 43 of those come in the book of Leviticus alone. Now, we can just ask the question. Did any Jew with the working knowledge of the Old Testament, specifically the law of Moses, as it pertains to uh, the Levites, did they have any understanding of the concept of atonement just on what we've presented so far? Sure they did. Sure they did. The very first example of the nation of Israel, the very first example that they have relating being free from bondage pertains to one element. Blood. In Exodus chapter 12, as God is bringing the final plague upon the nation of Egypt, they were given instructions regarding the Passover. The, the lamb of a year without blemish, he's to be killed in the evening and his blood is to be put on the doorpost and the lintels. And as God would come through, his destroyer would come through, when he saw the blood, he would pass over. The result of this is going to be them being made free from bondage. So blood was going to free them from bondage. The very first example we have of this freedom from bondage pertains to, to what element? The blood. In Exodus 30, verse 10, it says, And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year, speaking of the altar, with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in a year thou shalt make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy. So this is the day of atonement. This is what Hebrews 10 speaks of in those first three verses as it pertains to a remembrance made of sin. Every year they had a day to remember what? Sin. And every day they would see blood flow from the veins of animals because they would understand that when they sinned, it cost a life every year. Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Now I wonder how they would be as white as snow. When 
I'm showing you is the Old Testament is full of the concept of atonement, reconciliation, redemption, forgiveness through blood. In Leviticus 8.15, it says that he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar, round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar, and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. Second Chronicles 29, 24. And the priest killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, I wonder if Daniel, if, if Peter knew anything of any of these verses. Why wouldn't he? We should draw conclusions based upon what now? A guess? Nope. I think? Nope. Evidence. Conclusions should only be based on evidence. Now I wonder, in Peter being a Jew, Peter being uh, uh, zealous for the law when he lived under it, I wonder if Peter knew anything about Daniel 9 24, to make an end for sins. I wonder if he knew anything about to bring in everlasting righteousness through a certain sacrifice. Yes, he did. He did. Jeremiah spoke of the new covenant where sin would be no longer remembered as opposed to the remembrance of a year by year, which we referenced, uh, Exodus 30, 10, Leviticus 16. I wonder if Peter understood Jeremiah 31. I wonder if Peter understood Jeremiah 31 all the way, uh, beginning of verse 31 through 34, when it says that he would remember sins no more. It's a simple question. Did Peter understand it or didn't he? You guys can turn to Jeremiah 31 right now if you'd like and begin reading in 30, verse 31, and you'll see it's not that difficult. It's just not that difficult. For this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they'll be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor or every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. And I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now you tell me, is that that difficult? That's not too tough, is it? The concept of remembering sins no more, the concept of a sacrifice that would take away the separation between man and God, that's not exactly Rocket science, is it? That's pretty simple. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. And I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 2. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. The element that would forgive man of sins was not a was not blood flowing from the veins of a bull or a goat, but it was the blood flowing in the veins of Christ. Matthew 26, 28, Revelation 1, 5 and 6. He's washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's the blood that would atone. Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and he has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now I wonder, written 700 years before Jesus, and Peter could have read that every day for all we know during his adult life, did he understand that concept in Isaiah 53? If the laying of our transgressions upon Christ isn't the concept of a vicarious sacrifice to make atonement for sins, what is it? What about Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 10? Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, yet put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Did Peter know that? How long ago did Isaiah write about that? Seven centuries before Peter came on the scene. I wonder if Peter ever read it. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. When was that written? Seven centuries before Jesus. What is that if not the concept of atonement or reconciliation? Did Peter know that? Sure, Peter knew that. Any reasonable 
Jew would have known that. I wonder if Peter understood this in Leviticus 17 and verse 11. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Now, when was that written? You know who wrote the book of Leviticus by inspiration? Moses. You know, Moses was about, what, 400 and some odd years after Abraham. So you're looking at 3,500 years ago. 1,500 years before Peter. Now, I wonder if he knew about that. What self-respecting Jew wouldn't have understood Leviticus 17 verse 11? You think that 16 centuries of seeing it every day uh, and seeing it every year for the Day of Atonement would have been something that could have at least got them to understand the concept of atonement? Now, granted, they missed it when Jesus came and they misunderstood a lot of the law. This isn't that difficult. I would love to see it. I would love to be able to draw a reasonable conclusion based upon the evidence that someone else brings to show me that Peter had no Old Testament knowledge and the Old Testament is full of the concept of atonement. What are we supposed to be? If you're going to be reasonable, if you're going to be rational, you're going to draw conclusions based on what now? Evidence. You've been presented evidence to show that the Old Testament is thoroughly furnished with the concept of atonement. Now, where is the evidence to the contrary? It's like evolution. You want to believe in evolution? That's okay. You don't believe in your little fairy tale? That's all right. Why don't you bring me some evidence? In Isaiah chapter 41, it would say, Bring forth your call, saith the Lord, and your strong reasoning, saying to God, saith the God of Jacob. Where's, where's the evidence? When did the Old Testament end? Well, it was still in effect when Jesus was on earth. It was still in effect when John was teaching in Luke 16, 16. It says, for the law was still in effect during John's time. It was until John. The law and the prophets were until John. What, what law did Peter live under until Acts 2? The old law? John would have knowledge of this concept of the nation of Israel. You know what's interesting? In Luke 1, as John's father, Zacharias, was speaking of John to come, he says, And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. What's that? That's the concept of reconciliation. It's the concept of atonement. Who would give it out? John would. Well, Zacharias spoke of it. He must have had some kind of understanding. John is going to be preaching baptism for remission of sins, a baptism of repentance to the nation of Israel. Peter would have knowledge of this teaching. Notice in John 1, beginning in verse 40, it says, One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is interpreted the Christ. One of the two which heard John speaks, Simon, uh, Andrew, John, uh, Peter's own brother, he, he knew John's teaching. Do you think, do you think Peter didn't know it? In Matthew chapter 3, it says that John baptized all of Judea. And in John chapter 4, it said that Jesus and his disciples baptized more than John. Do you really think that they didn't have an understanding of this concept of remission of sin? Remember, folks, you cannot separate the concept of reconciliation from man's sins being forgiven. Do you know why? What separates man from God? Sins. What has to be removed in order for man to come back to God? Sin. How do you do that? Well, remission. If you're forgiven of sin, then you're no longer separated from God, are you? That's easy. Let's keep going. Old Testament knowledge. We've shown you the Old Testament knew all about atonement. What about Jesus? Did Jesus know anything about atonement? Peter himself was present when Jesus told him about his blood being for remission of sins. In Matthew 26, it says this. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You know, it's almost insulting to say that Jesus didn't know what he was doing there. Why did Jesus live every day for you? You ever thought about that? Yeah, he died for you. But do you know he lived for you? Have you ever woke up in a bad mood? You ever woke up and you're a little snappy at somebody? You ever woke up and you're angry at someone and you say something you shouldn't and you sin? Guess who didn't do that? Jesus. 
Do you know that he held his tongue? He, he controlled himself every second of his life just so he could die for you? Did you know that? I wonder if he understood what his death was going to bring about. Yes, he understood that. Sure he did. He understood it, and guess who he told it to? Peter and the rest of the apostles. My blood shed for remission of sins. Man being forgiven of sins is vital to the entire concept of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, Paul would say as much. He'd say, wherefore, if any man is in Christ, notice that, in Christ, there's only one way in Christ, obedience to the gospel. Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, but all things are of God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And gave unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not committing unto them their trespasses. That very concept is to be forgiven of sin through obedience to the gospel and to be added to the one and only church wherein is fellowship with God. We're no longer uh, enemies, Romans 5, but we are saved through the blood of Christ. That's the concept. The concept of reconciliation, the concept of forgiveness is synonymous. Peter himself was told by Jesus that remission of sins would be taught in his name beginning in Jerusalem. Jesus would say, and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now based upon Peter's Old Testament knowledge, based upon Peter's knowledge of John's teaching and Jesus' own teaching and this baptism that they taught, would they understand the concept of remission of sins or wouldn't they? It's not, it's not a tough question. There's two answers. Yes or no? Yes. Based on what now, Eric, are we drawing this conclusion? Based on evidence. Where is the evidence to show that Peter was clueless about this? Where is the evidence to show he was ignorant? about this concept whenever it was so thoroughly presented. How about this one? The Holy Spirit's teachings. Well, this is all the Holy Spirit's teachings, that's true. But we're talking about that specifically separate from Jesus' own teachings. The teaching of the text itself, which came out of the mouth of Peter, shows that the concept of remission of sins or reconciliation was understood in Acts chapter 2. As Peter is speaking to those on Pentecost, he quotes from Joel 2.32. And in verse number 21 he says, And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everybody understand what the concept of saved means? What are you saved from? Are you saved from a rampaging beast? Are you saved from a murderer? No, no, you're saved from your sins. Right? In Luke chapter 7, verse 48 and verse 50, Jesus said that those whose sins were forgiven were saved. That's the concept. So in Acts chapter 2, they said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, saved from your sins. In verse number 38, Peter would say, when they asked him the question, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What is the difference in repenting and being baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins and calling upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved? There's no difference. It's the same concept. To call upon the name of the Lord is to look to the Lord to save you by doing what the Lord told you to do. That's pretty simple. That's as simple as it is. That's all there is to it. Verse 41, The day that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be. What's that? Saved? Well, that's what he said back in verse 21. How were they saved? Verse 47. Verse 41. They heard the message and they obeyed the message. The result? They were saved. Saved from what else? Sin. That's the concept of remission. That's the concept of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit knew it and Peter's the one that said it. Do you really think that he didn't understand? We're not talking about some Old Testament prophecy spoken of hundreds of years before Jesus would come on the scene. We're not talking about Isaiah speaking of the, the law that would go forth from Jerusalem in Isaiah 2 and 2 and 3. He didn't know every detail about it, but guess what, folks? This isn't spoken of in prophetic form. This is spoken of in the then and now by Peter. He's saying to those present, you will be saved from your sins if you do this. Now, that's not that difficult. Let's look at this argumentation. Peter was a what? Peter was an apostle. Peter was a personal ambassador on behalf of Christ. Guess who else was? 
Paul. Paul was an apostle. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 5, Paul says that he was an apostle and he was not behind any of the others. Peter was an inspired apostle and he had the same inspired teaching that Paul did. In Romans 5, Paul understood the concept of reconciliation. You ready for this? But God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, that wasn't that difficult. You see, Paul spoke about that as an established fact. It was already that they had received this atonement. He understood it. Why didn't Peter? We're trying to draw reasonable conclusions, right? Based on what? Evidence. Where is the evidence that would show that Peter was ignorant of the concept that Paul knew very well? How about this? Maybe this is something we didn't think about. Peter's reasoning. Old Testament, full of the concept of atonement. Jesus' teaching, full of the concept of atonement. The Holy Spirit's teaching, full of the concept of atonement. Peter's own words. How about this? Peter's reasoning. Peter was a sharp guy. How do you know that, Eric? Well, allow me to demonstrate what I mean. In Matthew chapter 16, they are in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus comes and asks a, a specific question. And he says, who do men say that I, the son of, man, uh, son of man, am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's interesting what Jesus would say. Jesus would say this, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> no man came and said, hey, guess what, Peter? This guy's Jesus. This guy's the Messiah. Flesh and blood didn't, didn't do this, but, but who? My Father. My Father in heaven. Simply by the demonstration of Jesus' uh, deity, by confirmation with, with miracles and the very words that Jesus spoke, confirmed that this was the Son of God. So God revealed to Peter and everybody else around him that if they were paying attention, they knew full well this was the Christ. Peter reasoned this out, he figured it out, and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, Peter was pretty sharp. Let's keep going. Peter was shown that vision we talked about a minute ago in Acts chapter 10. He saw all those beasts come down in the sheep. And God said, Rise, get, uh, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And he says, don't you call unclean what I've cleansed. Now the point was, Peter was about to go preach to the Gentiles. And he was to understand that the Gentiles were no longer unclean. They were to be understood as being accepted into the church upon their compliance with divine terms, the gospel of Jesus. Peter, though, didn't get it at the time, did he? In verse 17 and verse 19, it says he thought. He wondered, what does this vision mean? But notice this. Based upon the vision and the angel's words to Cornelius... As Peter comes to Cornelius, Cornelius actually recites back what the angel said to him. In Acts 10 and verse 22, it says that he will tell thee words. In verse 33, he says that I am, we're all gathered here to hear all the things commanded thee of God. So from Peter's vision and from Cornelius' response, Peter made a reasonable, rational conclusion. He based a conclusion upon evidence. And you know what he said? He would say that God is no respecter of persons. Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Do you know, Peter reasoned this. He says, I perceive. Peter was shown vision. He was given evidence by Cornelius. And he drew a reasonable what? Conclusion. You know what? Based upon God's words to Cornelius and my vision, I conclude that God is telling me not to call these Gentiles unclean. But any nation that fears God and works righteousness is accepted. That's the entire point. Peter reasoned all this out. He's a pretty sharp guy. We understand that some aspects of truth were better understood as time went on. There's no doubt. But the concept of reconciliation to God, the concept of what man had to do to be forgiven of sins, was clearly established in Acts 2. On the day of Pentecost in AD 30, not AD 60, not AD 96, AD 30, from the very beginning... They knew full well what man must do in order to obtain remission of sins. Wouldn't Peter's own teaching be a good measurement of what he knew about this topic? Old Testament, full of it. Jesus' teaching, full of it. Holy Spirit's teaching, full of it. Peter was a reasonable guy. What about Peter's own teaching? 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, 
through sanctification of the Spirit, unto sprinkling, uh, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. That's pretty good. Okay, so Peter understood the concept of blood. He knew back that he could look back to Exodus 24 and see the blood of the covenant, which these folks entered in when he sprinkled it on the book and the, the human beings there that were amenable to that law. He understood what this covenant meant and what that blood meant. And he understood what Jesus' blood meant. It's his own words. Why don't you let him tell you? Verses 18 through 20. For as much as you know that you were redeemed. That's an interesting word. All back. For as much as you know you were redeemed, not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain life, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Now, did he understand the concept of the blood of Christ as it pertained to redeeming man, or didn't he? Remember, all you've got to do to draw a reasonable conclusion is bring some evidence, right? I've presented you with some evidence, so let's see yours, right? When this lesson's over with, I'll be back there. Bring me. Bring me some evidence. I don't think you can do it. And that's not a reflection upon you. That's simply stating a fact. It can't be done. What about this one? He understood that souls were purified by truth, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Did he understand that a soul can be purified by obedience to truth? Yes, he did. He said it in Acts 15.9. Cornelius' household, their hearts were purified by faith. What's the difference? There is no. He understood obtaining mercy through the sacrifice of Jesus. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. How did he understand the concept of obtaining mercy? Well, he knew that sins were forgiven through Christ. He knew that. He understood that Jesus paid the price, 1 Peter 2, 23 and 24, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now, wait a minute. Peter now is going all the way back to Isaiah 53. I guess he did understand it, didn't he? All those years ago, he understood what Isaiah wrote. And he understood the concept of Jesus bearing our punishment in his body. He knew that. He understood that Jesus suffered for us and that Jesus made it possible for man to be reconciled. To God, For Christ has also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Now, pray tell, what is that but the concept of atonement? The concept of reconciling man to God through a vicarious sacrifice, what is it but that? Who wrote this? Peter. Where's the evidence to the contrary? The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer or request of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Christ. Same writer, he understood the concept of being saved from sins by obedience to the gospel. He knew that. Where is the evidence to the contrary? You know, it's, it's really kind of difficult. You know, sometimes we wonder how folks can misunderstand such plain teaching. Well, they need help sometimes. And unfortunately, the world's full of them. They give you help. All of these so-called pastors, all of these so-called uh, seminaries, teaching error and, and twisting scriptures to lead folks all in, just leading them happy as they can be, lead them all to hell. That's awful. Isn't it? This is pretty simple. The concept of remission of sins is easy to understand. And there's really no excuse not to understand the preparation given by the inspired teaching of the Holy Spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. You know what that is? That's John's account of the Great Commission. It's the exact same spoken of in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 through 20, and Luke 24, 47. It's the same concept. It's the same thing. They were told to preach the gospel, repentance and baptism for remission of sins. 
Belief and baptism. And you're saved. Mark 16, 16. It's the same thing. The preparation given and the inspired teaching of the Holy Spirit made this very clear. Peter understood what was needed to obtain the remission of sins. And obviously those who heard it and obeyed, they understood it too. You know why? Because they gladly received his word and they were baptized. And the same day were added to them about 3,000 souls. That's easy, folks. That's so simple. Shouldn't we be eager to answer error? Should, sure we should. Shouldn't we do our very best to make sure that there's plain, uh, plain understanding of, of, of easy uh, scriptural teaching? We should. Shouldn't we be very careful to make sure that we handle the right word of truth and that we only draw conclusions that are based upon scriptural evidence? We, we better or you're going to be in trouble. I'd like to offer the invitation at this time. Are there any here today that have never obeyed the gospel? You might be saying, well, I don't know. What does that mean? Man cannot be saved by saying a prayer. Man cannot be saved by accepting Jesus in your heart. That's simply foreign to this book. There's only one way in which man can be saved, and it involves these things. Number one, you must hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and 6. So faith is necessary. We, we must hear it, and we must believe it. John chapter 20, 30 and 31. These words, we can believe in Christ through these words. This inspired teaching. If you believe his teaching, you're going to do what he tells you to do. And that involves repenting of your sins. Ma uh, Matthew chapter 21, 28, 29. Repentance is a change in will. I'm changing my mind about these things. I know better now. And now I'm changing my actions. Those are fruits of repentance. Acts 26, 20. We must confess Christ before men. Why? Because he said so. Matthew 10, 22 and 23. Uh, 32 and 33. And also Romans 10, verse 10. Well, a confession with the mouth is made unto it goes towards salvation. But even at this point, you've not received one spiritual blessing. You've not been forgiven of one sin. It's only when you surrender yourself to be immersed into Christ for the remission of sins is when you're added to the church. It's when you contact the blood, Revelation 1, 5. And it's when you're forgiven of all trespasses, Colossians 2, 11 through 13. It's when you put your trust in God to forgive you by doing what God told you to do. And you must be faithful every day of your life. From then on, Colossians 1, 22 and 23, continuing in the faith. For those who have obeyed the gospel, what if you realize that you're not faithful? What if there is something in your life that is causing you to stumble constantly? What if you're engaging in constant unrepentant sin? We would encourage you to acknowledge your sin in prayer to God. Ask Him to forgive you, and He will if you want us to pray with you and for you. 1 John 5, 16, we know assuredly that we can and that God will hear. We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. Examine yourselves. If you need to obey the gospel, come forward. We'll study with you. We'll baptize you in Christ. Or if you need to come back to the Lord and need the prayers of the church, we'll offer them on your behalf. We beseech you, therefore, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God right now as we stand and sing. There's a fountain free just for you.